Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our reading of The Black Arrow. Today's chapter, Bloody as the Hunter. Let's get started. The lads lay quiet till the last footstep had melted on the wind. Then they arose, and with many an ache, for they were weary with constraint, clambered through the ruins and recrossed the ditch upon the rafter. Matcham had picked up the Vendak and went first, Dick following stiffly with his crossbow on his arm. And now, said Matcham, forth to Holywood. To Holywood, cried Dick. What good fellow stand shot? Not I? I would see you hanged first, Jack. Ye would leave me, would ye? Matcham asked. Aye, by my suit, returns Dick, and I be not in time to warn these lads I will go die with them. What? Would ye have me leave my own men that I have lived among? I trow not. Give me my windack. But there was nothing further from Matcham's mind. Dick, he said, ye swear before the saints that ye would see me safe to Holywood. Would ye be forsworn? Would you desert me, a perjurer? Nay, I swear for the best, returned Dick. I meant it too, but now. But look ye, Jack, turn again with me. Let me but warn these men, and if needs must, stand short with them. Then shall all be clear, and I will on again to Holywood, and purge mine oath. Ye but deride me, answered Matcham. These men ye go to succor are the same that hunt me to my ruin. Dick scratched his head. I cannot help it, Jack, he said. Here is no remedy. What would ye? Ye run no great peril, man, and at least are in the way of death. Death, he added. Think of it. What a moraine do ye keep me here for? Give me the wind, Jack. St. George, shall they all die? Richard Shelton, said Matcham, looking him squarely in the face. Would ye then join party with Sir Daniel? Have ye not ears? Heard ye not less Ellis what he said? Or have ye no heart for your own carny blood and the father that men slew? Harry Shelton, he said, and Sir Harry Shelton was your father as the sun shines in heaven. What would ye? Dick cried again. Would ye have me credit thieves? Nay, I have heard it before now, returned Matcham. The fame goeth currently it was Sir Daniel slew him. He slew him under oath in his own house. He shed the innocent blood. Heaven raries for the avenging on it. And you, the man's son, ye go about to comfort and defend the murderer? Jack, cried the lad, I know not. It may be, but no I. But see here, this man has bred me up and fostered me, and his men I have hunted with and played among. And to leave them in the hour of peril, O oh man, if I did that, I were stark dead to honor. Nay, Jack, ye would not ask it. Ye would not wish me to be base. But your father, Dick, said Matcham, somewhat wavering, your father, and your oath to me, ye took the saints to witness. My father, cried Shelton, nay, he would have me go. If Sir Daniel slew him, when the hour comes, this hand shall slay Sir Daniel, but neither him nor his realm are deserting peril. And for mine oath, good Jack, Ye shall absolve me of it here, for the life's sake 
of many men that hurt you not, and for mine honor ye shall set me free. I, Dick, never returned Matcham, and ye leave me ye are forsworn, and so I shall declare it. My blood beats, said Dick. Give me Levendak, give it me. I'll not, said Matcham. I'll save you in your teeth. No, cried Dick. I'll make you. Try it, said the other. They stood, looking in each other's eyes, each ready for a spring. Then Dick leaped, and though Matcham turned instantly and fled, in two bounds he was overtaken. The Rindak was twisted from his grasp. He was thrown roughly to the ground, and Dick stood across him, flushed and menacing with doubled fist. Matcham lay where he had fallen, with his face in the grass, not thinking of resistance. Dick bent his bow. I'll teach you, he cried fiercely. Oath or no oath, Ye may go hang for me. And he turned and began to run. Matcham was on his feet at once and began running after him. What do you want? cried Dick, stopping. What makes ye after me? Stand off! I will follow and I please, said Matcham. This word is free to me. Stand back, by your lady, retorted Dick, raising his bow. Ah, you are a brave boy, retorted Matcham. Shoot! Dick lowered his weapon in some confusion. See here, he said. You have done me ill enough. Go then, go your own way, and fair rise, or whether I will or not, I must even drive you to it. Well, said Matcham doggedly, you are the stronger. Do your worst. I shall not leave to follow thee, Dick, unless thou makest me, he added. Dick was almost beside himself. It went against his heart to beat a creature so defenseless, and, for the life of him, he knew no other way to rid himself of this unwelcome, and as he began to think, perhaps untrue companion. You are mad, I think, he cried. Fool fellow, I am hastening to your foes. As fast as foot can carry me, go I thither. I care not, Dick, replied the lad. If you are bound to die, Dick, I'll die too. I would leave go with you to prison, then... Go free without you. Well, returned the other, I may stand no longer prating. Follow me if you must, but if ye play me false, it shall but little advance you, mark ye lat. Shalt have a quarrel in line inwards, boy. So saying, Dick took once more to his heels, keeping in the margin of the thicket and looking briskly about him as he went. At a good pace, he rattled out of the dell and came again into the more open quarters of the wood. To the left, a little eminence appeared, spotted with golden gorse and crowned with a black tuft of firs. I shall see from there he thought, and struck for it across a healthy clearing. He had gone but a few yards when Matcham touched him on the arm and pointed. To the eastward of the summit there was a dip, and, as it were, a valley, passing to the other side. The heath was not yet out. All the ground was rusty like an unscored buckler and darted sparingly with yews, and there, 
one following another. Dick saw half a score green jerkins mounting the ascent and marching at their head. Conspicuous by his boar spear, Ellis Duckworth in person. One after another gained the top, showed for a moment against the sky, and then dipped upon the further side until the, the last was gone. Dick looked at Matcham with a kindlier eye. So you are to be true to me, Jack? He asked. I thought you were of the other party. Matcham began to sob. What cheer, cried Dick. Now the saints behold us. Would ye snuggle for a word? Ye hurt me, sobbed Matcham. Ye hurt me when ye threw me down. Ye are a coward to abuse your strength. Nay, that is fool's talk, said Dick roughly. Ye had no title to my Rendak, Master John. I would have done right to have well bastard you. If you go with me, you must obey me, and so come. Matcham had half a thought to stay behind, but seeing that Dick continued to scour full tilt towards the eminence and not so much as looked across his shoulder, he soon thought better of that and began to run in turn. But the ground was very difficult and steep. Dick had already a long start and had, at any rate, the lighter heels, and he had long since come to the summit crawled forward through the firs and ensconced himself in a thick tuft of gorse, before Matcham, panting like a deer, rejoined him and lay down in silence by his side. Below in the bottom of a considerable valley, the shortcut from Tunstall Hamlet round downwards to the ferry. It was well beaten, and the eye followed it easily from point to point. Here it was bordered by open glades. There the forest closed upon it. Every hundred yards it ran beside an ambush. Far down the path, the sun shone on seven steel salads. And from time to time, as the trees opened, Selden and his men could be seen riding briskly, still bent upon Sir Daniel's mission. The wind had somewhat fallen, but still tussled merrily with the trees, and perhaps had Appleyard been there, he would have drawn a warning from the troubled conduct of the birds. Now mark, Dick whispered, they be already well advanced into the wood. Their safety lieth rather in continuing forward, but see ye where this wide glade runneth down before us, and in the midst of it, these two score trees make like an island? There were their safety, and they but come sound as far as that. I will make shift to warn them, but my heart misgiveth me. They are but seven against so many, and they but carry crossbows. The long bow, Jack. Will have the uppermost ever. Meanwhile, Selden and his men still round up the path, ignorant of their danger, and momentarily drew nearer hand. Once indeed they paused, drew into a group, and seemed to point and listen. But it was something from far away across the plain that had arrested their attention. A hollow growl of cannon that came from time to time time upon the wind, and told of the great battle. It was worth a thought, to be sure, for if the voice of the big guns were thus become audible in Tunstone Forest, the fight must have rolled ever eastward, and the day, by consequence, gone sore against Sir Daniel and the Lords of the Dark Rose. But presently, the little troop began again to move forward, and came next to a very open, healthy portion of the way 
where but a single tongue of forest ran down to join the road. They were but just abreast of this when an arrow shone flying. One of the men threw up his arms, his horse reared, and both fell and struggled together in a mass. Even from where the boys lay, they could hear the rumor of the men's voices crying out. They could see the startled horses prancing. And presently, as the troop began to recover from their first surprise, one fellow beginning to dismount. A second arrow from somewhat farther off glanced in a wide arc. A second rider bit the dust. The man who was dismounting lost hold upon the rein, and his horse fled galloping, and dragged him by the foot along the road, bumping from stone to stone, and battered by the fleeing hoofs. The four who stone kept the saddle instantly broke and scattered. One wheeled and rolled, shrieking towards the ferry. The other three, with loose rein and flying raiment, came galloping up the road from Tunstone. From every clump they passed an arrow, sped. Soon a horse fell, but the rider found his feet and continued to pursue his comrades, till a second shot dispatched him. Another man fell, then another horse. Out of the whole troop there was but one fellow left, and he on foot, only in different directions. The noise of the galloping of three riderless horses was dying fast into the distance. All this time, not one of the assailants had for a moment showed himself. Here and there, along the path, horse or man rolled undispatched in his agony, but no merciful enemy broke cover to put them from their pain. The solitary survivor stood bewildered in the road beside his fallen charger. He had come the length of that broad glade, with the island of timber pointed out by Dick. He was not perhaps five hundred yards from where the boys lay hidden, and they could see him plainly looking to and fro in deadly expectation. But nothing came, and the man began to pluck up his courage, and suddenly unslung and bent his bow. At the same time, by something in his action, Dick recognized Soundin. At this offer of resistance from all about him in the covert of the woods, there rent up the sound of laughter. A score of men, at least for this was the very thickest of the ambush, joined in this cruel and untimely mirth. Then an arrow glanced over Selden's shoulder, and he leaped and ran a little back. Another dart struck quivering at his heel. He made for the cover. A third shaft leaped out right in his face, and fell short in front of him. And then the laughter was repeated loudly, rising and re-echoing from different thickets. It was plain that his assailants were but baiting him, as men in those days baited the poor bull, or as the cat stone trifled with the mouse. The skirmish was thrown over. Farther down the road, a fellow in green was already calmly gathering the arrows, and now, in the evil pleasure of their hearts, they gave themselves the spectacle of their poor fellow sinner in his torture. Selden began to understand. He uttered a roar of anger, shouldered his crossbow, and sent a quarrel at a venture into the wood. Chance favored him, for a slight cry responded. Then throwing down his weapon, Selden began to run before him up the glade, and almost in a straight line for Dick and Matcham. The companions of the Black Arrow now began to shoot in earnest, but they were properly served. Their chance had passed. Most of them had now to shoot against the sun, and Selden, as he ran, bounded from side to side to baffle and deceive their aim. Best of all, by turning up the glade, he had defeated 
their preparations. There were no marksmen posted higher up than the one whom he had just killed or wounded, and the confusion of the foresters' councils soon became apparent. A whistle sounded twice, and then again thrice. It was repeated from another quarter. The woods on either side became full of the sound of people bursting through the underwood, and a bewildered deer ran out into the open, stood for a second on three feet, with nose in air, and then plunged again into the thicket. Soden still ran, bounding. Ever and again an arrow followed him, but Stone would miss. It began to appear as if he might escape. Dick had his bow armed, ready to support him. Even Matcham, forgetful of his interest, took sides at heart from the poor fugitive, and both lads glowed and trembled in the ardor of their hearts. He was within fifty yards of them when an arrow struck him and he fell. He was up again, indeed upon the instant, but now he ran staggering, and like a blind man turned aside from his direction. Dick leaped to his feet and waved to him. Here! he cried. Less Ray, here is help. Nay, run, fellow, run! But just then a second arrow struck Selden in the shoulder, between the plates of his brigandine, and piercing through his jack, brought him like a stone to earth. Oh, the poor heart, cried Matcham with clasped hands. And Dick stood petrified upon the hill, a mark for archery. Ten to one, he had speedily been shot, for the foresters were furious with themselves and taken unaware by Dick's appearance in the rear of their position. But instantly, out of a quarter of the wood, surprisingly near to the two lads, a stentorian voice arose, the voice of Ellis Duckworth. Hold! it roared. Shoot not! Take him alive! This young Shelton, Harry's son! And immediately after, a shrill whistle sounded several times and was again taken up and repeated farther off. The whistle, it appeared, was John Amend Alms' battle trumpet, by which he published his directions. Ah, oh, foul fortune, cried Dick. We are undone. Swiftly, Jack, come swiftly. And the pair turned and ran back through the open pine clump that covered the summit of the hill. And that was our action-packed chapter. I'll see you all next time. See ya!